Lord our God, we thank you that we can meet on Christmas morning in this way. Lord, we look back over the recent times when we were unable to do so much around Christmas <coughs> due to COVID and the restrictions. And uh, even last year, there were restrictions. So Lord our God, we thank you that they have been lifted this year, that from that point of view, we in society here in our country. And so we thank you for these restored freedoms that not only mean that we can meet like this to worship you on Christmas morning, but we can see each other, uh, we can see our families, we can sleep over uh, together. Lord, we thank you for all your goodness and mercy towards us. And we are here, our God, to uh, express our praise and worship to you. We come as your people. Lord, we have just sang about coming together as faithful. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us faith to believe in your Son, the one who we are celebrating, the one who we are reading about, the reading of his coming into our world, the one, our God, who is God and made flesh and living among us. Lord, you've given us faith to believe in him, and that's what makes us a faithful people. Lord, we are no better, no different to anybody else. Lord, we don't compare ourselves to others and imagine ourselves to be better or more this or more that. Lord, we are no different to anybody else. We are sinners like anyone else. But Lord, you have loved us and saved us and called us to faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you that we can come together and sing these familiar carols that focus on the coming of your Son into our world. Lord, we can remind ourselves of uh, Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem and the circumstances around the birth of your son. We can think of the shepherds and what happened to them. Lord, all so familiar to us. Many, many years ago, we have thought about what we call the nativity. And we thank you that here we are again to think about it again, to look for some new insights, to hear you, our God, speak to us again about the coming of your Son into our world. So we commend ourselves to you as a congregation. We thank you for each other. We ask your blessing upon each other. And Lord, we commit the whole day to you. Lord, we commit what our plans are for the day, what we intend to do, who we intend to see. And Lord, as we commend the plans to you, we do ask your blessing upon us, on our families. Lord, we want to thank you for our families. Lord, we thank you for those that we'll be spending time with today. Lord, we remember those who will be separated from today and then hope to see in, in the days to come. Lord, we do thank you for family life, for the joys and the challenges of family life. And Lord, we do pray your blessing upon our families. Lord, we thank you that at this time of year we can express to our families uh, the love that we have for them. And Lord, that love takes the shape of a gift that we are able to give. And Lord, all this just makes us reflect on your love uh, for the world and the gift that you gave to the world. Lord, that verse that is so familiar for God, so loved the world, that you gave your only begotten Son. And we know that the word giving there is the word forgive. <laughs> And so uh, what we do in a very small measure by giving gifts to each other as expressions of love today, we thank you, our God, that you have given the ultimate gift in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. And that gift is the symbol of the greatest love that you, our God, have for the world. And that gift of your Son, Lord, like any other gift, needs to be received. And surely today, our God, as we give gifts to our loved ones, whether they're expensive or not so expensive, Lord, those gifts will be received. And Lord, we will receive gifts that we have asked for, maybe. We will receive surprise gifts. We may even receive gifts that Lord have made a great impression on us, maybe. But nonetheless, we know, our God, that whatever gifts we share today will be received by all of us. But Lord, as we think of this then, we, we see how your great gift of your Son still has to be received. Both for that gift of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brings, the forgiveness of sins, 
peace with God, and life everlasting. That did has to be received. Lord, you are offering it, and uh, you reach out to men and women with that gift in your hands. And Lord, as we read the Bible and as we see around us, Lord, men and women refuse that gift, reject it, don't want it, turn away from it. Lord, turn to any other thing that God offer, and in fact, anything but the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, we think of this then, and we think of those who are refusing the great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray for that. Lord, that we've said already that we are no better, and we are no better than anyone else, but we can choose our gift either. Because we too refuse it for so long. And Lord, we would have continued to refuse the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, had you not made us willing to receive it. And Lord, there's the great difference. We don't have to make our loved ones willing. We don't have to persuade them to receive the gifts that we have. But Lord, because of sin, this great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, freely offered by you to all men and women everywhere, Lord, is a gift that we can only accept if you make us willing. If by your grace and your love and by the work of your Holy Spirit, if you work in our minds and our hearts, if you show us what the gift is and our need of it, if you do all this work first, then, our oh God, then we will receive it. So we do pray, our oh God, for uh, all men and women today, uh, as they receive gifts of all kinds and shapes and sizes throughout the world. Lord, we ask that your spirit would help us to think about the great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And as men and women think of that, may your Spirit make all willing to receive that gift. Make men and women our God gently persuade men and women of their need for that greatest gift that will take them into eternity, that will bring them a place in heaven. Lord, grant this as we pray this for our families and our neighbours and our friends and our colleagues. Hear our prayers as we give thanks to you for your great love for us, expressed in the person of your Son. So we ask your blessing. Lord, we recognise rightly that for many this time of year is challenging as well as joyful. Lord, we think of those who are ill. We think of those, our Lord, who will grieve the loss of loved ones from this year or previous years. And Lord, we are recognized that what it means to be human is that things are always mixed. Lord, we can't have a simple, undiluted joy. There will always be elements, notes, moments. Lord, we, uh, even a great thing like Christmas Day can be changed with a painful memory or a sense of absence. So we do pray, of God, for any in our congregation, any who belong to our church, not here today, who may find such moments today. Bless them, help them, comfort them, strengthen them, our God, because we know that through your Son, Jesus Christ, he too came into family life and knows how to his life. So hear our praise as we pray in the name of your Son, who told his disciples when they prayed to them, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So let's turn to one seven one, shall we? One hundred and seventy one heart that angels say, Glory to the new born king. Let's stand to say one seven one.
you're going to look at Matthew's gospel together and to see how it's an account of God with us. So we are celebrating today uh, the, the child who is the saviour, who's going to save his people from their sins, and we are celebrating God with us. And what we see in the new year, maybe, is uh, the way in which Jesus Emmanuel will save his people. We we'll think about who those people are. Everybody, maybe, or a specific people, we we'll think of that. But Matthew's great concern is the name. Now, I don't think it's wrong, is it, to, to think about other birds, other babies, 39 grandparents this year. You think about babies, you think about their names, you take time in choosing a name. So Matthew's reflecting that on it in his gospel. What does it mean to give a name to a baby? Well, here's Jesus Emmanuel in Matthew's gospel. And then if you go to Luke, he read from Luke earlier. What do you think is Luke's interest? What's Luke focusing on when he tells us about Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem? Uh, there's this great sense that mm -hmm. apparently nobody could find in the historic records. Doesn't matter. There's a sense that people are traveling. There's a great upheaval. Lots of migrations of people to different towns. Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem which is the, uh, if you like, where they, they're from originally, and they go to be registered, and Mary goes into labour. What's, what's Luke's great interest, you think? What's he focusing on in this account he gives us? You have the first seven verses there, which is the account of the actual birth, and then from verse 8 down to verse 20, you get this uh, emphasis on the shepherds out in the fields at night, and they watch it, they flocks, we know the story really well. What do you reckon then is the great interest of Luke? And I think the interest is found when you have this great chorus of angels who suddenly appear and they say this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And I think Luke's sin is heaven and earth. What's going on? at the birth of Jesus, from the point of view of heaven, and what's going on from the point of view of earth. And you can take both and think about both. From an earth point of view, it's night, it's dark, it's traveled, the shepherds, as you know, are outside us. And then from heaven, it's light, and it's song, and it's celebration, and it's rejoicing. And I think what Luke is telling us is in the person of Jesus, this child, this baby, heaven and earth meets. The purposes of heaven are focused on this child and worked out through the child. So, as I see it, Luke 2 is heaven and earth. And that verse, verse 14, glory to God in the heavens and on earth. So, heaven and earth meeting. In heaven there is rejoicing, there is glory to God, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Now that's a very cool translation. I don't know if you noticed, I went from a different translation earlier. And that translation is a bit better because it means peace, not as in no conflict between nations, but it means peace with God, and it means towards those men to whom God is well disposed. So heaven and earth is Luke's theme. And then as we to round that, let's go to John's Gospel then, and in chapter 1, John also has an account. His is very different to Matthew's, very different to Luke. John doesn't focus on Mary or Joseph. John's focus in talking to us is about the person. Who is this person then that we are celebrating today? And John wants to tell you two things. This person is God. That's John's great lesson. That as you think about a baby, and as you think about Bethlehem and the manger, who you're thinking about is God. And very God. An actual God. The God. That's what John wants to tell you. So he starts off like this. In the beginning, and that's the echo of Genesis 1 and the creation story. So in the beginning, when God created, what John says is that God who created 
is now the God who's amongst us. The God who's in that manger. The God who spoke and said, let there be light. That's the God that we are celebrating and rejoicing on Christmas morning. So John was then first telling you that he is God. And then in verse 14 of John 1, he says, The word as God becomes flesh. And there's a much better translation than everyone. The word who is God becomes human. And that's the second thing John wants you to know. Is God becomes human. That little baby, if you will, is fully human, real human, but he is God who has become human and who has taken our nature and it is going to live our life, who's going to live our experience, who's going to know everything it means to be human. It's the creator God who spoke and brought the world into being. That creator God becomes the creature. The creature he made, he becomes human and he lives among us. And that's the great celebration of Christmas. And of course, what John then also tells us this. As many as received him, as many as believed in him, as many as accept him, that's the word God who's human living among us, as many as accept him, to those God will give the right to become children of God, to as many as believe in his name. And then John does this trick. He's been talking about God becoming human and living among us, born among us. And then he says, everybody who accepts this person is also born. Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So John is playing on the idea of being born. God is born and takes our nature, and then everyone who accepts this person, Jesus, is in her own right born, born a second time, born of God. Not born by parents or family or friends or neighbors, but born of God. And that's the great mystery that we're celebrating. So, May, that's Matthew, heaven and earth is Luke. And then John's great emphasis is on the person himself. Let's pray together. Lord, as we think then of Jesus, as we think about Christmas, as we think about a baby being born in those dreadful circumstances that Luke has brought us, Lord, what we see from each of the writers of these biographies of Jesus called the Gospels, we see how each of them, apart from art maybe, how they give us a different point of view. Matthew focuses on the name. And Lord, as we think of the name that was given, not chosen by Joseph, both parents who choose the names of their child for themselves. And we know in this culture of the New Testament, the Father will choose the name. But here it is, you are God, choosing that name to, to teach us that Jesus saved his people from their sins. We thank you for the name Emmanuel, that we have Jesus Emmanuel, one who is God with us. Lord, you see Luke focus on heaven and earth, glory to God in the highest, singing and light and rejoicing and angels in the heavens, and then on earth in darkness, and shepherds and fear. But Lord our God, heaven and earth meet in the person of that baby in the manger. And Lord, we thank you that through that person we have peace with God. Lord, none of us feel that we can do justice to what God tells us. The person of that baby, very God, real God, God Himself, taking human nature. Becoming human and living amongst us, born amongst us. And then, as many as we see it, as many as believe in it, Lord, we too have been born, born of you, born by you, our God. 
born in this supernatural way. And we thank him. Lord John tells us that many reject him. Many turn away from him. Many seek to destroy him. But as many as receive him. So they were in John's day, those who received. They have been in every day, those who have received Jesus Christ. And we thank you, our God, that even to today, there are people still receiving Jesus Christ for themselves, being born of God. And to each one, you, our God, give the right to that individual to be a child of God. To have their sins forgiven and to have peace with you. Lord, we do thank you there for this time of the year. We thank you for this opportunity to reflect on God coming into our world and becoming human and living among us. So, Lord, we thank you for Him, Jesus Christ. We thank you for His life. Lord, we think about His life in the new year as Matthew talks about God with us. And what that looks like. And Lord, we know that his life will end upon the cross. And we think about that in a moment or two. And Lord, we do rejoice that you sent your son into the world to be our sin. So we have of you praise in his name. Amen. Amen. We'll sing from our power box in the right, 175. And what we do is we'll sing um, the first. Uh, five verses, and then we stop and we take communion together, and then after communion, we will sing the last verse, which is verse six of God. So, one seven five, one sing Royal David City, stood a golden apple chair. Let's take the five verses, we take our seats, and then we take the Lord's Supper together. That's one seven five. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, when we think of a baby, we think of our baby's future sometimes. We wonder how life would work out for that child. Lord, it's not wrong to think about will this baby grow up to be a certain profession, how life would be for that baby. Lord, that's perfectly natural and human for us to do that. And whilst we take great joy in the baby, we do think about what the future holds. But Lord, as we come to your Son, Jesus Christ, the future had already been told Mary and Joseph that he was born to save his people from their sins. And that that would mean for him that he would <coughs> be a perfect life, that he would then be arrested, put on trial, sentenced to death, even though he was innocent. And he would die a criminal's death upon an instrument of torture on the cross. And he would die there, innocent and yet condemned, but would die for the sins of those people. The ones whom the angel told Joseph about, he would save his people from their sins. He would do that by dying upon a cross, in their place, being punished for their sins himself as their representative. Lord our God, may ponder these things in her heart. Lord, he would think deeply over the years as she watched his hand grow up about the future that you had for him, that he had come to a couple according to your will and your purpose. Lord, we have eaten the bread and we thought about that human nature that he took of himself that body that would be broken upon the cross. And Jesus had told us to do it himself because he understood why he had come. So Lord, he took that bread and broke it and gave thanks and said, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So we've done that. We are remembering him coming into our world. 
but we're also now remembering him upon the cross as he died for our salvation. So Lord, as we have done that, we give thanks to you, and as we move to the next thing now that we do in this act of remembrance, take the cup. Lord, we are thinking about him shedding his blood upon that cross as he was paying that price for our sin. So help us as we do that then, remembering as many as receive him, to then you give the right to be children of God. Amen. So with Sabbath and the great day, he takes the cup. Let's get the cup with the new covenant in my mouth there for you. Drink all of it. You'll take a cup and we'll drink together. Let's drink the cup. Well, we drank the cup together. This cup is called the cup of salvation. Jesus drank it with his disciples in the upper room on the night on which he was betrayed. And Lord, what we've been doing so far is running back. Back to his birth amongst us, back to his death upon the cross. But Lord, in this communion service, there's also this looking forward, this uh, turning of our heads from looking back in the past to looking into the future. Because Lord, as we just sang, and we continue to do so now in a moment, Lord, we are reminding ourselves of a future when Jesus Christ will come a second time. Not born in an only stadium, not at night where so few saw him, but he will come in great glory. He will come with the sound of a trumpet. At the voice of an angel, Christ will come again in triumph and power and majesty. He will come to uh, bring all men and women before him. He will set up his judgment throne, and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So our God, we conclude by looking forward. Lord, we will soon be going into a new year, and we look forward in that way. But Lord, this is the big picture. This is the great cosmic picture. Your great purpose, our God, that you will send your son in triumph, and we will either meet him in the air or come with him and be forever with the Lord. As we look forward then, we say, Come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Amen.